Hello everyone! Uh, yes, I will tell you the next story at the end of tonight. Actually, you're going to get um, two things because we're going to do a short story and then we're going to do another novel study afterwards and I'm going to tell you about both of them. So let's jump in to this book. Uh, I am I have been looking forward to this all week. So first of all, let's say happy birthday to the bard. It is William Shakespeare's birthday today, April 23rd, which is why I picked to have class. So you are going to notice um, this statue and quotes from the bard that apply to what we're reading in the story throughout. So this is gonna be super fun. Okay, so besides this one, what is a book that has made you cry? I wanna know what books have made you cry. And if you feel like it, I'd like to hear whether you sometimes kinda like it when a book makes you cry. Like, sometimes it feels good. I'm just curious. Like, so, oh, Dracon, <laughs> it's not nice. Let's see, um, let me look and see what you say. Yes, Michael Archer, birthday to the bard. Yes, awesome. All right, <laughs> I am super excited about tonight, even though this book makes me cry. All right, so thank you, stars. Let's look at some of the comments from the last stream. I have, I do not have a bard puppet. Well, it, it's not a puppet, but I do have a William Shakespeare doll that sits on my desk all the time. So, sits right here. So, no puppet, but hopefully that's good enough, Mark. Okay, so, okay, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows. Yes, that made me cry too. Percy checked up flowers for Algernon. I know, thanks for bringing that up. Trigger. Oh, we got that trigger alert there. All right, let's look at what's going on. <gasps> Bridget Terabithia, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Michael says he has a heart of brick. I doubt that's true. Okay, so he says, my sister's going to be watching class tonight. And Michael, I want to know, is she here tonight? What did she think about it? Inquiring minds want to know. Like, did she like it? Did she understand? Did she drink the Kool-Aid? Is she back tonight? So let's find out. And then I, this was when I asked, like, why the whole middle section of this book kind of slows way down and why would the author do that? There's like all this action in the beginning and then of course what we are talking about tonight is just like bam, 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 bam. But then you've got this lag in the middle and so I'm curious, I was asking like why do you think an author would do that and Michael said because the lag gives us something with which to contrast to the climax and I thought that was a great response. And Clownfall said, it seemed like it lagged in the middle to me, but sometimes that's a good thing because it gives you a bit of a break. And then when the climax comes, you really appreciate it. And I think that that is true too, like that that it's probably not the best idea for an author to have just intensity from beginning to end. I think you can emotionally exhaust a reader. And then uh, Simon said, I haven't seen Simon yet tonight. Let's see if Simon shows up. And you know who I'm missing? My cookie cookie. I need my hashtags. So Simon said the book that forever changed my mind about the power of teachers. And I was hoping he would be here because um, I was hoping he would be here because I wasn't hundred percent sure what book he was talking about here. I think it might have been um, his majesty's dragon, which I actually recommended to an eighth grader today. So, all right. I, oh, thank you for that feedback. A sleepover, what? Yeah, it is a little harder when you haven't read the material, but the next one will be a short story, so that will be easier for her. All right, next. And some of you noticed this, which is that, yes, there is a Wikipedia page. Um, interesting fact, you cannot create a Wikipedia page about yourself, and um, if somebody does make a Wikipedia page about you, you will find out about how many of your private details of your life are on the internet. All right, Cladville said, it's easier to notice the negative 
but this is when we're talking about the grades on the report card, um, because it's easier to end up with a negative. It requires less work to get a D than an A, so that lack of F that lack of effort attracts attention next to so many A's. I had never thought of that. That like it's it's the disparity. It's the the difference there. So that was cool. Strudel Kitty, stupid is the presence of information but refusing to use it. Ignorance is just not having information. I think that is a super important um, distinction to make, and I thought you did it really clear. And Michael, yes, I am. Oh, I'm totally famous. Absolutely famous. All right, she said she wasn't being kind. She was just trying to inflate her sense of self-support uh, importance. This is when um, Maddie was teaching him um, by learning an ignorant boy. It wasn't about kindness so much as ego. And that sounds like kind of a smackdown, Michael, but I think you're right. And then I think that we, we were talking about here about whether there was this disparity in the way that Rob handled like things related to his pet versus wild animals and like was it cold the way that these things are discussed and I almost all of you commented about how no I mean he's just he's living on a farm and that's the way it is on a farm and you kind of got that when I asked you what your favorite um, things to see were your favorite sites I will say sunset on the beach one um, there were others as well, but this one was definitely the fa favorite. And then these were when, oh, you guys, these were awesome. These were awesome. This was when I asked you to do these um, participial phrases at the end of your, um, at the end of your sentence. And I thought these, these were a couple that caught my eye. Um, the van stars read ahead of the sign chapters, hoping to gain more wisdom than their peers. I stumbled down the stairs, gripping on the banister, hoping steadily. Oh, uh, the van stars read ahead of the sign chapters, hoping the author would not lie, and <laughs> no pigs truly would die. Uh, it was cute. Remember, I really like that sentence structure, so keep that in mind. And then, I this was when, like the um guy, uh that his like mistress had a illegitimate child and she like they both died and and it was a very different than how we've seen Haven where he's been very you know puritanistic essentially but he was supportive and I, I thought this was nice he showed empathy and kindness I will tell you tonight is gonna be like Haven uh, uh, admiration club okay so Scale one to five, these chapters, Jay Sand, I already know your number. I got your number, Jay Sand. Um, so tell me, one to five, what do you think? Bring out the decimals. Bring out the decimals. All right, ready to dive in? Let's go. All right, so I'm saying that the four key events are the weaseling, um, his father telling him he's dying, the slaughter of Pinky, spoiler, um, and then the death of his father. So those are the, to me, like the four main things. Although I think you could replace his father tells him he's dying with something else. So choose one of these. What should I have put in instead? Um, breeding Pinky, the shooting of the squirrel, or the burial of the father. So instead of father tells me he's dying what about these what would you pick what would you pick okay Aiden's got like, interesting Michael Archer uh, yeah oh poor Michael with his irritation with buildings Roman all right I love Strudel Kitty. You know what? Three. I hope that's how you said it. Um, let's see. I'm just looking at the numbers. This is fun. Okay, so looking to see Pinky. Yeah, Breeding Pinky. Okay, Mark thinks I should substitute that. Uh, number one, Breeding Pinky. Okay, interesting. Yeah, oh, wow. Lots of votes for that. Okay, his burial was important. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Okay, so this is what Serignus wants us to do tonight. Serignus 
wants us to look for contrasts, like how dragons breathe fire, but yet are also sweet and nice, like loving Serignus, right? So that's what we're going to do because he's our mascot and, you know, we're at his mercy. So that's what we're doing tonight. We're looking for a contrast. And when I am going to point a contrast out to you, you will see this slide that says foil. Because foil is one of the words that we use in language arts when we're talking about contrast. And a foil is when I want something, I want to prove how hard something is, so I put it next to something really soft. I want to prove how mean a character is, so I put them next to someone really nice. I want to prove, and, and if it's a character, we call it foil. If it is um, like a, a situation, we usually call it juxtaposition. So juxtaposition is usually when we're going to juxtapose like a, a circumstance or an event. A foil is typically what we talk about with a character. So there are actually a lot of words in language arts that refer to this same kind of thing. I'm going to use foil because it's easier to show a picture of foil rather than juxtaposition. But a lot of what we're talking about today is going to be juxtaposition. Okay, so chapter 11. This is Haven Wisdom. So our new, our new hashtag for tonight, first one, Haven Wisdom. And he is, it is like a Haven Wisdom Smackdown tonight. All right, Benjamin Tanner will stand without hitching. So this is a hitching post for horses. And I love this. Like Benjamin Tanner does not need to be tied up to something. Benjamin Tanner will stand up and he will stand there and he doesn't need anybody to do that. And then I told all I could tell and made up the rest. And, and this is when he's telling about when he went to the fair. And I never let on that I got a touch of the vapors and lost all my breakfast on the judge's shoe. Okay, so here's my uh, question for you. At what point does leaving out parts become a lie? So, like, when is the story no longer the story, but something altogether different because you left out key things? You know, like, sometimes somebody's telling me a story and I find out later, like, oh, okay, except for how you left out the main part. Is that even the story? Or is it a different story? So I'm kind of curious, how much does someone have to leave out to make it, no longer really true. Okay, and I loved this when when Rob hears his parents talking, how's the traveler, I heard Papa ask. Back, Mama said, from a dream. And I just love that, I just love that. Uh, in the story, they do not say how the dad died. They don't say what he had. He realized that he was sick, but didn't say what he had. I think it's probably cancer, is my guess. Um, Okay, and Will says, okay, so we're talking about these back from a dream. And the bard says, dreams are toys from the winter's tale. And I love that, the idea that dreams are toys, like that you can play with them. And I was wondering if you've ever had a real experience that was so wonderful that it felt like a dream or it actually was a dream come true. Like you, you had a dream and... See, I feel like that light is doing the same thing that it did before. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you see how it, like, flashes? Let me see if I just turn off my ring light. Because I think last time when Jonathan was here, we found out it was a ring light. I know I'm darker now. But you know, you know that it's better to be darker than to be turning, like, like pink and then white and then everything. Okay, so let me back here. All right. So curious if you've ever had an experience like this or something that was so wonderful, it felt like a dream come true. And I'm not just saying this because Mr. Van Star is over there doing the chat, but that's how I feel about the day we got married is that it was, it was like, it felt like a dream because it was just such a wonderful day. True story. Mr. Van Star and I got married, um, like 11 o'clock in the morning. And then there was a lunch and then we and a bunch of people who were at the wedding went to the zoo. True story. True story. And that's where I bought that naked mole rat. 
was at the um, little gift shop at the zoo. And who else likes the gift shop more than the actual place you're going? Like, that's totally me. I like going places like museums and stuff, and my favorite part is the gift shop. All right, let me see what you guys say. You've never had an experience that wonderful. Most of your dreams are weird and coffee and dish. You should not be drinking coffee. So I don't think I'd want that many of them coming true. Um, my dreams don't connect to my life that way. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, all right, so I would like to remember my side of the mountain for a moment. Um, if you guys remember this, do you remember this character? Do you remember this character? Who remembers who this is? from my side of the mountain who remembers this guy's name just curious if anybody remembers but this is what this is a slide i went and got from my side of the mountain no other animal i knew and i knew quite a few by now had been so brave in my presence and i just was wondering um the if you guys remember because now we're going to get into this so the weaseling, ah, the weaseling. Okay, so yes, Baron Weasel, Mark, you remember? I bet a bunch of you do. Yeah, Baron Ron Weasel, yes. Oh, you guys, isn't that fun? Like that's that's one of the fun things about reading is that you, you're like, oh, like Baron Weasel and you actually care more about this weasel because of Baron Weasel. All right, so. This is what Haven says, why they're going to weasel the dog. Because once you weasel that dog, that dog will hate weasels until her last breath. She'll always know when there's one around and she'll track it to that hole, dig it out and tear it up. A man who keeps a hen house got to have a good weasel dog. Here's what's the craziest thing. Not last Sunday, but the Sunday before, after church. I know it sounds like a joke or a sing-song thing. Not last Sunday, but Sunday before, after church, um, my friend Kevin and I, and she, Kevin is a woman. Kevin and I, it's K-E-V-E-N. Kevin and I were standing in the parking lot seriously for two hours. We stood out there so long, my part got burned. And we were talking. And one of the things she told us was that her daughter lives on a, um, like 23 acres in Iowa, and they have chickens, and their chickens all kept getting killed and they would find the headless body of the chicken inside the pen and eventually every single one of their chickens was killed that way and the chickens were their pet of their daughter who really struggles and needed those pets and they finally figured out what it was it was a weasel it was a weasel that was going through the fence and killing the chicken and then pulling it out but couldn't get the chicken through and and eventually just pulled off its head and so when I read this, I was like, wow, like this is a real thing. If you have chickens, you are in real trouble. It's not the ring light. It's not the ring it's light. Still happening. It's still happening. Mm. I don't know what it is. Neither. I don't know what it is. Is it any better without the ring light? We thought we figured out it was a ring light. Yeah. Okay, so here's what happens. I want to know this. In what ways... Do you think this is both good and bad reasoning? Right here. This is Haven it, uh, talking. In what ways is this both reasonable and unreasonable? Both good and bad. Jason, did I flush one of the chickens down the toilet? I wish I had my clapper. I would give you a clap for that. That is very good. Hashtag chicken in the toilet. <laughs> That's so awesome. Okay, so... Uh, let's see. Looking for this... Yep. Okay. So in what ways is that good? Okay. And then here we go. In you go. Is your lid ready? And when I read that, no matter how many times I read this book, no matter how many times I read this book, when I get to this part, I'm like, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. And then this is, this is Rob. I thought a fight between a weasel, a dog and a weasel was going to be a real excitement, but I hated every second of it. And um, there's something that, that the author, that Robert Newman Peck does here, that he, um, that he continues through the story, which is that he often does this. I want you to watch for this sentence structure. He often will, instead of where most English teachers would tell you to combine your sentences, he separates them and starts the second sentence with a conjunction. So it's kind of interesting. Oh, Michael, that's fantastic. Awesome. Okay, so I want you to notice that. We, we need to look closely 
when we notice odd sentence structure, it's really important to look closely and think about what's the effect of this? Why is the author doing this? Why, especially when the author just throws aside kind of accepted practice? Wrong on levels. Cruel, unnecessary, and the dog dies, so it's wasteful, but good. I can't see a bright side. Okay, so yeah, once we know what happens, we can't see the bright side, but that's easy thinking. Let's think about the thinking of it before, right? It, it's not the first time that they've heard of this, so why is that? Ooh, Mark, interesting. Slows the reader down for emphasis. Okay, and Will says, all that glitters is not gold. So you think it's going to be this great thing to weasel this dog, and it is not. And I'm curious about how common this is in life, where something like this, let me go back to the quote I'm talking about here, this, I thought a fight between a dog and a weasel was going to be a real excitement, but I hated every second of it. And so here's my question for you. So how common is this? Like, can you think of other things in your life that result in this feeling like you thought it was going to be amazing and then it wasn't, or you thought it was going to be neutral and it was terrible? Curious about those things. All right, then we heard the dog cry. It was a whine that I will always remember the kind of sound you hear, but never want to hear again. I personally have never, I've never heard a sound like that, I don't think. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe, but I don't know. Yeah. So what do you think Rob's feeling right now? I want to know some possible emotions. So let's pull out Calliope our muse of epic poetry, and ask her to inspire you that, oh yeah, I see the light now, and ask her to inspire you to um, give some adjectives of how you think Rob is feeling. How do you think Rob is feeling right now at the end of the weaseling? Clivey, help him out. So, and then, and then Rob, who is very much, has very much been raised to be polite to older people, says, kill her, and if you don't kill her, I will. And then Ira says, mind your tongue, boy, you're talking to your elders. But Papa sticks up for Rob, and that's kind of interesting. Um, so, that, that's kind of interesting. He says, the boy's right, I'll get a gun. And I thought it was interesting. Okay, shouldn't you wait for a natural setting so the dog will have some real experience? Yeah, I don't know how you do it. Like, how do you do it? I don't know. Not enthusiastic about the class at first. No need to apologize. No need to apologize. But now I'm full-edged van star in every moment. Yeah, okay. There you go. The opposite, right? That's the opposite. Yeah, why such a small dog? I think because it's a dog they had, right? It's a dog they had. And they had chickens. And so they're thinking that this is a good idea. So we know. In, okay. So... Nobody said it were Mr. Vanstar's rolling over. He's going to try to figure out these lights, the I think. I think the oh, he thinks it might be the color of the lights behind me. It's the camera doing it. Oh, it's the camera doing it. Okay, well, then I'm going to turn my light back on. I'm going to turn my light back on, y'all. see if that makes a difference. Ta-da! All right. Nobody said a word. The three of us just stood there looking down into the dust at what once was a friendly little pet. And I think it's like a lot to ask of this little dog to be a friendly little pet and a vicious weasel killer. Um, I think sometimes a lot of people ask too much of their dogs. Okay, horror, disgust, guilt, sickened, guilty, anxious, yeah, shocked, nice, empathetic, disturbed, um, guilt, shocked, yeah, nice. Oh, Mark, of course, yeah, there have been lots of things that I get dragged to kicking and screaming or voluntold I'm going to do, and then I end up liking them. So that's common human experience. I'm not offended in any way. And then Haven Wisdom, I share by the, I swear by the, whole, the, by the book of Shaker and all that's holy, I will never again weasel a dog, even if I lose every chicken I own. And so again, Haven Wisdom, and I think that this is an important thing, is that even though he is so wise, he is open to learning more. He is willing to express regret and learn and move on. So is that in or out of character? I kind of just answered it. Is that in or out of character for Haven? Mm, I'm going to kind of skip that question unless you have something you really feel like you want to talk about. I'm curious, Mr. Vanstar, if he thinks that changing the color of the light is impacting whether it's flashy or not. I, I don't know. 
Well, there he goes. He says he hasn't seen it happen again. So Will says, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. That's from Henry IV. Um, and I think this is very true. Whoever's in charge, it's not an easy job. I would like you to consider that every person who is really in charge, it's a very lonely thing because you really have no peers. And that's, that's really lonely. Um, okay, so chapter 12. That's chapter 11. Moving on to chapter 12. And Haven says, dying is dirty business like getting born. Again, notice, notice the sentence breakup um, again. And also Haven wisdom. Yeah, a lot of people are repulsive. I see this. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, just because people aren't educated doesn't mean they're not knowledgeable about the world, right? Like he knew so much about farming. And then we have this. I'm sure glad that nobody will kill Pinky. She's going to be a brood sow, isn't she, Papa? He didn't answer. And this is what you think when you hear that. Ready? <laughs> oh, thank you, Mark, for answering that. It is in character. He doesn't like hurting things unless he's a reason. And he discovered on that day that this wasn't worth it. Nice. Okay. He didn't answer. <laughs> You know what that means, don't you? You know what that means. Yeah. And that is contrast. Yeah. And Oh, oh, and that's contrast. Ooh, tell me what you mean, Cloudfall. Cla tell me what you mean, because I didn't put a foil side in here. So tell me what you mean, because I'm loving it. And Will says, the rest is silence. The Merchant of Venice. And then look at this. We've got this beautiful scene. Looking down across the valley, it was yellow with goldenrod. And this is goldenrod, this flower here. Like somebody broke eggs all over the hillside. And I just thought that was an interesting thing. Like, do you remember in the last class how we kept talking about comparing it to August? And I was like, what's with August? And in this one, I was like, like somebody broke eggs all over the hillside? And interestingly, Mr. Vanstar and I, we had scrambled eggs for dinner. And I don't want to tell you what else we had because we have bacon. Okay. Um, all right. Now, it's your turn. And it was delicious. It's your turn. And Mr. Van Star says, and it was delicious. All right. Mr. Van Star says this. Now, it is your turn. It is your turn. You are going to fill this in. Do or do not. There is no try. Looking down across the valley, it was yellow with goldenrod like. Think of something. I'm showing you a picture of goldenrod. Give me a simile. Give me a simile. Like what? Not like somebody just poured scrambled eggs all down the hill. Give me something else. Do or do not. There is no try. Give it to me. All right. You know, true fact while you're doing this, fun fact. Um, oh, the quote about both dying and being born being dirty business. Nice. Yes, 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 Cloudfall. Good call. Ooh, good call, Cloudfall. Nice. Yes, scramble it. Don't you guys like breakfast for dinner? We have breakfast for dinner every Sunday, and I know today's Friday, but that's what we had. All right. Um, whenever I talk to my class about standardized testing, I talk like Yoda. I do. I do, I do, I do. All right. So let me see your things. Let me see your things. I'm not seeing any scramble. I'm giving you a nice job, and I haven't seen any answers yet. Give me a simile. Let me go back. Like the tips of immature wheat. Okay. It was yellow with goldenrod like... Okay, thank you, Strudel Kitty. Aiden, come on, you can think of one. You could do it. You could do it. I see Mr. Vanstar's comment. He's a gas. He's so funny. All right, I'm going to give you a nice job, even though you don't deserve it yet. But we'll see. Like powdered pencils. Oh, <gasps> Cuffle, you're on fire. Like pineapple. Aiden, make that stronger. Like, like, because outside of pineapples aren't yellow. So how could you do it up? Like crushed pineapples scattered down the hillside? Something like that. Nice. Would I please speak like Yoda for the rest of the class? Think about it. I will. All right. Let's see. It was yellow with goldenrod. Like the rays of the sun. Nice. Okay. There we go. All right. You can have your nice peeps. All right. Oops. 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 I went ahead. It was like he was yanked off the limb by a rope. And you know what we're talking about now? A squirrel. We're talking about a squirrel. I should have brought a squirrel puppet. Um, he fell kicking into a mess of leaves and brush. And when I got to him, he was still twisting. 
Okay, this is the part that's weird to me. This is what is so weird to me, is that he's upset about the dog, and so his mom tells him to go kill a squirrel. I just think it seems like a weird thing to do. And I feel like this is just this, like, contrast because it's like, it is a foil, right? It's like this, it's, it's a juxtaposition of that he's like, upset about the weasel and the dog but he's not upset about shooting this squirrel and having it like fall kicking into a mess of leaves and brush and still twisting like this is horrible and like it's still in agony and he like ah! like something fake plastic and yellow bought in a gift shop like what like a bunch of yellow duckies thrown down the hill yellow m&ms aiden i like that one Okay, so I think there's a contrast there. But what I want to know is, what I want to know is, how are the weaseling and the death of the squirrel similar and different? And do you think that Pet puts them next to each other on purpose? Does the author put the, these two things next to each other on purpose? How are they similar and different? Give it to me. Share with me, you will, your ideas in the chat you shall put. Imagine if your relaxation was going out and killing things. I know, right? <laughs> yes. Squirrels are so wild though. Okay, so is that the difference between like wild versus domesticated? Interesting. Interesting. All right, and I wanna know, who wants to shoot the squirrel, cut open his stomach carefully, and put the nuts from the stomach on top of their cake. Because <laughs> that's what he does in the story. Right? Yellow lemon drops thrown recklessly down the hillside. I love that. I love lemon drops. Except they, like, hurt the top of my mouth. But I like them anyway. All right. <laughs> Michael couldn't think of anything wholesome. All right. Who wants to do this? Who wants to cut open a squirrel's stomach cut out the nuts that the squirrel has already eaten and semi-digested and put it on their cake. I was reading the book like, oh wait, what? Were any of you doing that? Were any of you doing that? And I love this meme like, what? That's so crazy. Who does that? Who does that? Haven Wisdom. His dad says, Rob, it ain't a fair world. All right, and so let's look at this whale of word there. And uh, let's bring Clypey in for this one. Clypey, tell us why this is interesting. Well, lots of times we think that whale of the word has to be something nobody's ever heard of. Oh, I don't like that voice for Clypey. Hold on, I need to change it. Lots of times people think that whale of a word has to be something complex, complicated, and unfamiliar. But often the biggest whales of a word of all are those that are familiar words that have deeper meanings than we ever think of. Okay. Thank you, Clyde P. Anytime. Okay, so let's look at fair. So many meanings. Oh, Michael Archer with an interesting insight. Maybe because he thought that killing a squirrel was not a waste because they're gonna eat the nuts, right? Yet weaseling a dog that barely survived was a waste. Interesting. I like that insight. Okay, so, so many meanings of the word fair. So many meanings. It actually takes, a, like, it, I, I could go on forever. Okay, first of all, it means pleasing to the eye. Like, it, um, you'll, you'll see this in Shakespeare, especially. You know, so happy birthday, bard. Um, you'll see, like, fair, the fair maiden, right? Also, agreeable weather. The, you know, the weather was fair. Morally good is also a, a meaning in the Old English, and we see that in, in applications of it, like you see down the bottom, fair play, right? So it's like morally good. Equitable, right? Like it's equitable, it's fair. We divided it fairly. And then favorable wind, not an excessive wind, right? We had fair winds. To, to place. And then you see fair hyphenate. It's compounded in lots of different words. I just put in a few, but there are so many. Fair play, fair haired, fair weather, fair sex, fair game. I don't know if any of you can see it. Calliope Yoda. That's so funny. Um, like an immature sun in all its glory. Wow. Nice. 
I should do ASMR. That is so funny. You know what? I actually do really like ASMR stuff. Okay, to go back for a brief moment, the squirrel's this cute little animal, somehow a perfect embodiment of nature, but then the dog is expected to be ferocious yet companionable. Yes, yes, that's exactly my point. Thank you, couple. So do not forget these other meanings of fair. You're going to see them, especially when you're reading older archaic literature, um, and make sure that you recognize what meaning they're using here. It's a whale of a word. Here's an example. Will says, fair thoughts and happy hours attend on you. Happy birthday, Bard. Okay, so here's the context. Rob messes up that black ash application on the trees. He doesn't do it quite right. And it results in a problem with the apple crop. And Haven Wisdom again. You'll do it right next spring, Rob. Just take time with things. One chore done beats two done ragged. Beats two done ragged. Sorry, I cut that word off a little bit, but beats two done ragged. And I love that, right? Isn't that true? Isn't it better to do one thing well than to do two things like just terrible? Yes, it is. Okay, so Papa said once that wood heats you three times. Once when you cut, yes, it is funny, Michael, that it, you fair is ubiquitous. It really is. Birthday to the bar. Yep. Papa said once it would heat you three times when you cut it, haul it, and burn it. And I was thinking about this, and I couldn't think. And it can also, okay, I don't know if this happened to you, but my screen just flashed. Um, it can also burn more calories, so that's kind of interesting. Um, okay, words with so many varying meanings. Yes. Yeah, mine did too. Yes, there are. Oh, Mr. Vanstar said his screen flashed too. That's kind of weird. We're in the middle of a big storm here. So we got the Texas storms going on, so. But our internet should stay, but you know, who knows. Um, can you think of anything that does this? I don't know. Okay, so, and then he says, winter is coming. And I couldn't resist a Game of Thrones reference when he flat out says winter is coming. And it made me wonder, it made me wonder if the author of Game of Thrones got it from here. The idea of winter is coming. I don't know. So, oh boy, other people saying it's still going on. Animals? No. Yeah, there you go. Animals? No, you know what, Deb Coatney? I think that's a fair comparison to make, right? Yeah, like you hunt the animal, you then can like, like think about Sam in My Side of the Mountain. He like, the hunting of the animal gave him something to do and kept his mind active. And then he ate the animal and then he used the skins. So, yeah, nice. Okay. Will says, now is the winter of our discontent. I actually love this line. It's part of a longer speech in Richard III um, about the York dynasty. It's really good. Um, but now is the winter of our discontent. So, winter is coming. Now is the winter of discontent. I love this haven wisdom. Need is a weak word. Has nothing to do with what people get. Ain't what you need that matters. It's what you do. And I thought that was interesting. I thought you could make some arguments. And then he tells him, because this is my last winter. And then and after, after Rob's dad tells him, this is my last winter. I know I'm going to die. He goes back home and Rob stays there and he says, I stayed there until the fire died so it would not have to die alone. And I think there's some foreshadowing here. All right, chapter 13. Here we go. So this is a problem. They want Pinky. Like, Okay, so what does Rob want Pinky to do? Rob wants Pinky to be a brood sow as opposed to runt bacon, right? But they don't keep farm animals for pets. In fact, if they were true shakers, they wouldn't keep pets at all. But we know they're faker shakers. But if they were true shakers, they wouldn't keep pets at all. But um, I think that the problem here is, is that Pinky only has two choices to do her part of the plan. You remember when that discussion happened in part one of the book of like everybody has their part to play in the plan 
and Pinky's part to play in the plan is one of two. She can either be a brood sow or she can be bacon. And that's it. There is not a third option. There is no highway option, right? So um, I'm looking I'm looking at your, I'm just looking at your uh, things. How about we keep Pinky as a pet? Yeah, that will keep Pinky as a pet. But Pinky is not going to be a good brood sow. She just didn't, for some reason, something went wrong, and she didn't um, develop in the way that, that pigs are expected to. And, um, yeah, th the experience between her and Samson is one of the things that gets this book banned. It's really graphic, and it is definitely no love story. It is no love story. This is no Samson and Delilah, Samson and Pinky. No, no love story. So it's a problem. And um, because it didn't work, um, because they, and they tried twice, it didn't work, um, then we know that there's a problem. So October came with colors as pretty as laundry on a line. Now, I thought that this was interesting. Um, I thought that Boo Samson, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, we can't be too hard on Samson. It's just what boars do. I mean, that's just who they are. A lot of times we want animals to act like humans. And we, yeah, it's, yeah, but Boo Samson. All right, we don't like Samson. We want to vote Samson off of the farm. So, yeah, we don't like Samson. We're no fans. Uh, but I, I thought this was an interesting simile. October came with colors as pretty as laundry on a line. Um, and I thought this was an interesting choice. What else do you think he could have compared the colors of October to? All right, so while you guys are giving me some for that, I will look at your comments about things. Yeah, it was brutal. It was awful. Yeah, you'll notice that I skipped over any real description of it. I mean, it's terrible. Um, I think that it is part of what the author's doing in this book, is that he's showing the contrast between the brutality of life on the farm, and yet how many people have this glorified, like, like misty-eyed view of what rural life is like. Like, everybody's like, oh, remember our whale of a word, bucolic? That they have this idea of bu bucolic, um, bucolic life, that it's so simple and so lovely and gentle, but he's showing, no, it is brutal. It is brutal. It is not pretty. It is not pretty. So, and I think we can refer to Soviet architecture here, Michael. That's fine. Um, why can't she have another option? Because there isn't another option. Like, I think that's one of the things that's so important about reading is that we have this view that, like, if we just do stuff, you know, if we just make right choices, we can make everything fine. But that is not how the world is. The world is not like that. Yeah, it isn't. You're you're right, Strudel Kitty. It's crops is heartbreaking work, but more wholesomely simple. But almost everybody who has crops also has animals. So then, this is it. She says I could have potential, and Miss Malcolm says I could be more than a farmer. I think being a farmer is better than being an accountant. Convince me otherwise. Go ahead, tell me. Tell me how I'm wrong. Am I wrong? Being a farmer is better than being an accountant. I say that. I'm interested in seeing what you have to say. I think being a farmer is better. All right. And then, and then this is Rob describing his dad to Mr. Tanner. He works inside himself like he's been trying all his life to catch up to something. But whatever it is, it's always ahead of him and he can't reach it. I thought this was so sad. I thought this was so sad. Like, just this idea that his dad never really got... Like, it's why he's living so vicariously through Rob, right? Like, why it's so important for him that Rob goes to school. Is that he just... It's like this thing. And thank you for the support, Sam. I hope it's me you're talking to that I am not wrong. Um, but I am welcome to be wrong. Okay, it could depend on what you like. You could never work in a blue-collar job. I hate being a farmer. Being an accountant would be tolerable for you. Okay. There we go. Pinky the cart donkey. Yes, that needs to be a hashtag. That absolutely, that's a good one, Mark. That's a good one. 
Accountants do math. Math is awesome. Farmers don't get to sit around doing math all day. <laughs> okay. Uh, farmer, there is a lot of math involved in farming, though. I just feel sorry for my accountant. That's all I have to say. All right. So I thought this was so sad. I thought this part was sad. Um, being a farmer requires more moral rectitude. Interesting. Something about the hard work that goes along with farming that isn't really matched by accounting. Yeah, accountants sit in front of a computer all day. All right, chapter 14. The apple crop was bad. And remember why? Because Rob messed up. Rob messed up. And then... <laughs> Mr. Vanstar asked me earlier how I know what props I'm going to use in any given class. And I said, sometimes I have one I know I want, and tonight it was this. <laughs> all right, it all ended early one morning on a dark December day. Y'all, do you remember in His Majesty's Dragon how they used to have Serignus eat the cows? Well, Serignus could probably have eaten Pinky, but that's not what happens. So... Will says, I that never did weep, now melt with woe, that winter should cut off our springtime. So, happy birthday, Bard. Here we go. Papa's, Papa, I said, I don't think I can. That ain't the issue, Rob. We have to. And this goes right along with what he said about need is a weak word. It isn't about what you need. It's about this. Can we get an alternate ending? I know. I hated it. Okay, so... Pinky is slaughtered, and his dad slaughters Pinky, and he helps. And he says, I hated him for killing her, and hated him for every piggy ever killed in his lifetime for hundreds and hundreds of butchered hogs. And I'm curious, does he really hate his dad here? He says he does. Does he really hate his dad? What do you think he hates? What do you think he hates? Does he really hate his dad? Why do you think he says, I hated him? I hated him. He says it twice. Does he really hate him? And if not, if yes, okay. If not, what do you think he really hates? And this is what he says about Pinky. This is Rob. She was the only thing I could point to and say, mine. But now there was no Pinky, so I cried. And I think that part of it would be the loss of any animal that you cared about. But I think the fact that he didn't really own anything, he just didn't really have anything that was his, made it so it was like even more of a loss to him and then haven wisdom again that's what being a man is all about boy it's just doing what's got to be done remember the head that wears the crown does not sit easy there we go rob hates him because he's dying interesting this is before his dad's death that's an interesting insight michael rob hates him because he's dying okay that's an interesting point because then you could say that he hates the fact that he knows he himself will be in this position at some point, right? And Cloudfault, no, he hates the pain brought about by the loss of Pinky. He hates that he knows that on some level the butchery of Pinky is necessary. Yeah, he hates this version of his dad. Okay, that's interesting, Mark, because we do see that, right? That his dad has these two sides foil. His dad has these two sides, this kind, compassionate dad, and then also this kind of aggressive hog slaughter. And okay, let's look at this. That's what being a man is all about. It's, it's just doing what's got to be done. Is that true? And is it what it means to be a woman instead of a girl as well? Just that that's what it means. That's the difference between an adult and a child is an adult will just do what has to be done. What do you think? And he said he did it because he had to, hated to, and had to. And Mrs. Van Star says, I want you to remember this scene. I, I, I know it's distressing. I know it's disturbing. But a lot of times the best, most impactful books for us in our lives are the ones that are distressing and disturbing. I think I've talked about that with the short stories. And I want you to remember this scene when his dad did something that he hated to do, but he had to do. And that is going to happen to you. That's going to happen to you. And you need to remember that, it, that you're not alone. And that it's been written about because it's a human experience. All right, let's see. He hates that Pinky is killed and his dad did it. Yeah, I think that's probably hard to reconcile, right? And then Michael says, I think he's reconciled to the fact that he's, 
he's got to take over by the time it rolls around, though. And he doesn't hate his father for burning him with the work of a man. That's what I'd say. Okay. He hates his dad for dying, not burning him with manhood. Interesting. Okay. He hates the situation, and then his father is the one who carries it out. Okay. Interesting. You guys, like, your insight is so strong. I always just really, I, I, I always, like, I learn from you. Like, you guys give insight in things I don't even think about. I look forward to this class so much to be able to hear your thoughts. His cruel, and this is how I describe it. Oh, 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 English teacher fail. See the typo? See the typo? His cruel pig sticking fist with its thick fingers so lightly on my cheek. And you know what this is? foil and it's this juxtaposition of the finger lightly on his cheek the same finger that just killed pinky all right let me see what what cloudfall says here i think that yeah that's right adults have this world of required duties and jobs and actions and taxes for instance whereas children are just sort of floating along doing whatever pleases them yeah think yeah instead of thick i wonder um michael if we could say that this is a new word think um, that has, it's think, but with an extra C, so it's like thick thinking. I wonder if I could get by with that. So what I want to point out here is just this constant tension in the story between the brutal and the tender. We've, we've talked about this, right? This story is just nonstop contrast between the brutal and the tender. And I think that that is really the essence of what Peck is trying to show. All right, so I know that kindness was the last chapter, but I want to point out some instances of kindness in this chapter about the slaughter of our beloved Pinky. And I know it may seem like there's not, but there are a lot of tender mercies here. So Mama and Aunt Carrie pretend to bundle Rob up, but really they're just trying to give him some comfort. Um, and then Haven sharpens the knife extra sharp. And you know why? Because if you get cut with a super sharp knife, you can't even fill it. Have you ever been cut with a super sharp knife? Yes, thick thinking. Um, and then Rob says, I've never seen any man work as fast. So he's trying to do it fast, which is a kindness both to Pinky and Rob. And then he turns Rob around so that his back is to Pinky. And then he admits his own heart is broken. And then he cries. Kindness it is. Kindness it is. And I think that that's one of the things to look for. Whenever you're reading something that seems really brutal, look for the tender mercies. Look for the kindness and see if you can find it. And I, I think, let me just say before I move to the next slide, that if you can find it in, in stories, then you can make that same thing happen in your life. That whenever something bad is going on around you or to you, you can look for kindness. And if you practice in books, it'll work. Um, yes, Michael says he's been cut by sharp and dull knives and being cut by a sharp knife is preferable for sure. All right, and he says, and then here we have some more foreshadowing because Rob says it's the first time I ever seen him do it, meaning cry the only time. And why is that? Because dad is, spoiler, about to die. Now, here's what the bard says. Happy birthday, bard! He says, if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. And what play was that from? Julius Caesar. You know what this is from? This is from um, the speech after, this is Mark Antony's speech. I have come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. All right, chapter 15, last chapter, last chapter. Papa lived through the winter. He died in his sleep out in the barn on the 3rd of May. And this is how Rob tells his mom and his aunt. Papa won't be coming up for breakfast, not this morning, and not ever again. Not ever again. What do you think of the way Rob tells his mother and aunt the news? Let's look at it again. Papa won't be coming up for breakfast, not this morning, and not ever again. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? <laughs> of course he is. And then, he's, then Rob says, when you're the only one to do something, it always gets done. And now Rob is giving Haven wisdom. Interesting, right? 
Papa Miss May the 4th. Oh, May the 4th be with you. All right. And then this is cool. This is Rob. I noticed something I not took note of previous. It was the handles of Papa's tools. Most of the tools were dark with age. Their handles were deep brown. But where Papa's hands had took a purchase on them, they were lighter in color, almost a gold. The wear of his labor had made them smooth and shiny. And, okay, that's super cool, Michael Archer, that you were Mark Antony, because Mark Antony is awesome character. Um, I loved this line, and it made me think of something in my real life. So my father was a contractor. He died um, 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago. Um, and when he died, I shipped his truck from California, where we're from, to Texas, where I live, and I filled his truck with his tools. That's all I kept were his tools. And that's me and my dad when I was seven years old. He was putting together a doll stroller that I had gotten for Christmas. And um, so I have been doing a lot of work in the yard and I've been using tools and I've been using my dad's tools. And this is one of them. This is a like a spade shovel. And these are his initials, RM, RM. If you can see it there, and I, I'm going to be really sad the day that I can't see them anymore, that he wrote them in Sharpie on here so he would never leave them on a job site. And I love using his tools. Here's another. This is a shovel of his that I use. And this is the one that really made me think of it in this passage because the, the handle of this is much thicker at the top. You can kind of see it here. It's narrower and much smoother where he actually held it digging. And I love holding my dad's tools. I love working with my dad's tools. And so when I read this scene in the book, it really struck me. And I think that's just the, the thing, the power of books, is that they not only prepare you for human experience, but they also reflect your own experience. And you, you have this feeling of, like, me, I, I've had that too. I know what you're talking about, right? And he says, unfolding the paper, I saw where Papa had tried to write his name. And I think that that's when we really get this feeling for how hard Haven tried. And Rob, when he's getting dressed for the funeral, says it's hell to be poor. But I was curious, like, why this? After all the suffering, all he suffered being poor, why that? And then this line, the title line of the book, there would be no work today, the day of his father's funeral, a day no pigs would die. And then Rob changes his tune. He says he wasn't rich, but he wasn't poor because he sees all these people show up to show their, pay their respects to him. And so I'm curious, like, do you think it's a change of attitude or like his view? Like what changed here where he was like, he was, it's, it's hell to be poor, but then he wasn't poor. Like what, how do you hold both of those? There's that juxtaposition, that foil, that contrast, that paradox. This is paradox. How can you, how can it be simultaneously held to be poor, but then you're not poor? Um, and then being his son was like knowing a king. I just love that. I just loved it. There wasn't much to eat except beans, and we lived on those all winter, beans and pork, and none of it was easy to swallow. And you know why, right? Because that pork is pinky. Will says, we have seen better days. Buried deep in the land he sweated so hard on and longed to own so much. Good night, Papa. And that's what he says. Ah, oh, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. That was all I could say. So I just turned and walked away from a patch of grassless land. So I, that was, I'll, I'll say something here. This is after Rob gives the eulogy at his father's funeral and they, they all walk away, and this is the end of the story. And um, I thought, when I read this book this time, I thought about something else that I would give as a eulogy for Haven Peck, and this is it. This is Teddy Roosevelt speaking at a speech at the Sorbonne in Paris, and the speech is called Citizen of the Re Citizenship in the Republic, but most people call it... Um, like the critic who counts or something like that. They call it something else, but it says this, and I make my English students in my real life class memorize this. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or the doer of deeds could have done them better, 
the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. And that is my eulogy for Haven Peck. And this is something I think to remember all your life. It is easy to criticize the man in the arena. That's what it's called, the man in the arena. It's really citizenship in the Republic, but they call it the man in the arena. It's easy to criticize the man in the arena. Don't ever be that person. Don't be that person who is criticizing somebody who's actually doing stuff. I love hearing kids who never do their homework complaining about a teacher. Oh, really? Okay, right? Or, or like somebody who sits around playing video games all day criticizing the president. Seriously? It is not the critic who counts. It is not the critic who counts. But I was crying like a baby at this part. Okay, so Robert Newton Peck, the author of the story, passed away last year. He died last year. Um, and this is his headstone. And he has a fine and gray memorial. And I went, and if you see underneath the picture of the memorial, I left flowers on the fine and gray memorial on behalf of our class to this author. Um, so that we could honor him as well for this experience that he's given us, right? That he's given us this experience. And this is from Hamlet, our last bard quote of the night. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Oh, okay, Haven Peck. All right, next class, you guys, next class, we're going to read a short story by Raoul Dahl, who wrote Danny the Champion of the World, um, James and the Giant Peach, Matilda, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, um, all of those. He wrote this short story, The Lamb to the Slaughter. I will put, I'll put the information on the website. I will also put it in the description box of this video probably tomorrow. And um, Lamb to the Slaughter, I think you're going to love it. Um, I think you're going to love it. It's dark and funny. It is dark and funny simultaneously. So... But, and that class is going to be May 14th. That class is going to be May 14th. Um, and uh, then after that, we are going to do something a little bit different in the summer. The next novel is this, King Arthur and um, His Knights of the Round Table by Roger Green. And this book, if you can see, is it's not, it's not tricky. It's... Um, it's a YA version of Arthurian legend, and I think that you will like it. Um, and it's not tremendously long. We're going to do it a little bit differently. What we're going to do is, instead of like a slide deck and having it more like a lesson, um, Van Spawn, our son Jonathan, is going to come over every time we talk about it, and we're going to do it with you guys like a book club. So we're going to be doing that. And um, so that's going to be the book. We'll be starting this in June. So we'll do, um, I'm just telling you now, so you get a chance to get it if you like. And maybe read some other Arthurian legend. I will put a whole bunch. Oh, that's so cool, Sam, that you're reading James and Giant Peach. So um, I will put links to a bunch of Arthurian legend that I recommend. And so there'll be a whole thing about that. So I think you're going to like it. And um, so, but for next class, next class, May 14th, let's read Lamb to the Slaughter. Now, I, I told Mr. Vanstar about it, and he thought it sounded, he thought it sounded like a cool story. So I think we're going to have a good time. You guys, I want to thank you so much for another wonderful experience with you. Um, it is always just such a treat and a treasure. I look forward to seeing you every time. And the Van Spawn will be making appearances. Yes, he will. He's the most voracious of readers of all our children. All our kids like to read, but he's the, he says giving books to him is like giving wood to a fire. He's a reader. 
So that's what we got in his Easter basket is a bunch of books. So, all right. So you guys have a good night and I will see you May 14th. Um, and we will, uh, 